you think uh, measures to be prepared, readiness is expensive, you should try a terrorist attack. It's a kind of uh, readiness, it's a kind of uh, insurance. Are we prepared in our heads? Are we um, afraid of uh, talking about this because it will affect us too much in our daily work? Uh, what, what kind of uh, feeling do we have on this point? And who you take a job? You go ahead. Um, I think in a certain way you're right. Um, at all levels we, we are focusing on our problems of our daily life. And if I see people in my institute dealing with um, hospital infections with multi-resistant strains um, or HIV or tuberculosis numbers, um, I think it's to a certain way it is okay not to to highlight too much and not to exaggerate on the on 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 the bio threat. Um, on the other side, I I discover that our political decision makers are very open to to discussions and they are ready to take political decision if they are wanna take a certain risk or if they wanna. Um, um, put money into risk mitigation strategies, but it's very difficult to, to, to give the right answer what will happen next. And I think that's the big point. There's such a huge uncertainty that we even have a project now how we deal with uncertainties. <laughs> so um, I don't want to always blame, at least in Germany I can say, the, the political decision level because they're willing to take decisions, but it's also very difficult on the technical level to, to really highlight where we have to go. And so I can just uh, um, say the things we already, already said, having a good ba database and, and trying to, to neutralize personal opinions and, and have a good scientific base where you can show where knowledge gaps are and where we should go. Um, I think uh, this is the most important step to, to give the, a good <coughs> basis for political decision making to them. I'm not sh at least in Germany I can say they're not afraid to do that, but it's very difficult to say where they should go. I would like to go back to the 22nd of July happening. Uh, we have seen what happened afterwards with all the debates in the newspapers and on the news, all the responsibilities, the leadership, the management, how to follow up. I think that by opening up for such a discussion and having such a debate as we, have having, we are having today, it enlightens us. It helps us to put this up on an agenda and realize the responsibility that we have to make good preparedness and response actions. And we do have systems in place, but maybe we have to realize that there's some gaps that we have that might be even identified through looking into scenarios, imagining the unpredictable. What do we fear? And if we do that together, I'm sure that we will have things in place it's good to know that we have some issues there, but at the same time, we cannot be prepared for maybe everything, as people say. Maybe we have to allow a risk. That is a political decision. But still, it's our responsibility to look into it and to look into the facts and the scenarios that it allows us to find out if we do have a threat or not. Oh, 
today's debate because I spent it playing with some anthrax in <laughs> the, uh, the lab of the FFI. Um, <laughs> don't worry, I did wash my hands. <laughs> but uh, I, I could hardly disagree more with the previous statement that we might need a, a, um, another attack to become less naive because we should really not become less naive. We need to not become more paranoid because I, well, I have to say that I think the um, analysis that the probability of a terrorist attack from using biological threats is low, but uh, the, the consequences are high. Um, well, uh, I'm not an expert, so I probably shouldn't say this, but my gut feeling is that this gets it the wrong way around. The incidents of it happening in the future seem to be pretty high, but the real impact should be rather low, except when we are expecting it to be a big impact and thus react or, as you say, overreact accordingly. Because the aim of a terrorist is to cause terror, and that's easily done by using something people fear. <coughs> and if you don't fear it, well, then the return is less. <coughs> and if agents as like Atrax, like Plague, that we also work with, uh, not at the FFI, but you know, show us though, if they had been so insanely dangerous as the public seemed to imagine from the well, from the media, then we would all be dead. I mean, not only my friends here, who I who do actual field work on this, or our colleagues in Kazakhstan and China and Namibia, who we also see doing field work on this, but everyone else as well, because if biological agents were that effective, evolution would do what evolution does and kill us all. But we're still alive. So what we are facing is a threat where the knowledge of the threat makes it more likely to happen. Because now we are so geared up on knowing that it's a threat that we're getting really, really good at detecting these agents in the field. So now it's actually possible to do a large impact with a few grams of anthrax spores. In earlier times, this wouldn't cause anything because maybe one person would be sick, maybe none. Maybe there have been attacks that we didn't even notice. But now, if you send a, a letter somewhere saying, hey, I spread anthrax spores around Kaluhan. Well, five years ago, we might not have noticed. Today, we would go out there and we would find these anthrax spores. And that would cost a hell of a lot of money to clean up. And it would also pave the way for a next real attack, because then we would use our stockpiles, as I've mentioned, of antibiotics, treating all the possibly exposed people who had been wandering around Kaiwan for the last couple of days, and essentially using what we had. And if someone wants to do some real damage, that's two weeks later is sort of the obvious <coughs> way of timing this. Um, and I think the way to solve this is not more surveillance, because we can't possibly do surveillance on everything. Uh, there are so many ways to kill people. I mean, the most famous terrorist of them all, the most feared killer of them all, he used a knife, Jack the Ripper, for instance. I mean, what did he kill? Like five <coughs> people, and he is still remembered, and he caused fear all over London. You can't do surveillance on the level where people can't get sharp metal objects. So. What we do need is more knowledge. As Janet said, we don't really know the fate of these agents when they are released. So we don't really know, we actually we know surprisingly little of how these things actually behave outside of the lab. What happens when they are not in the lab? What are the fates of the agents, as Janet said? <coughs> what, what are the possible pathways in which a biological terrorist can be more effective than a guy with a knife or a semi-automatic semi weapon? They probably are hard to find for a terrorist, but they might very well exist. And then we need to find this. And then we need to <coughs> put the surveillance on the points, on the agents, on the substances that makes a biological terrorist a real threat, a real 
a greater real threat than a guy with a knife or anti rifle. And this is a quite probably a quite limited subset of all the possible ways in which you can get some biological agent and spread it around and cause terror. Because we, we, we know surprisingly little of the basic facts. I mean, this morning I did a, what was called a solo project. I spent about well, $10 worth of um, stuff on a local garden center and you did it to do some stuff that hadn't been done before. And it looks like it might be interesting. And there are so many things we, we, we don't know. If you start to limit to this extensive surveillance of every possible deadly agent, then we actually end up not getting the knowledge we need to identify the real threats. And I guess this was a really, really poorly worded question because it was actually a response, more, a, a more of a response than a question, but I could obviously make it into a question by asking for a response. <laughs> Is it also a response to my question? Maybe I could give you just a few comments. Um, uh, I think you have a reality check you will see at the uh, uh, Antrax, just the name of it, will create much more fear than life. Exactly. You, you're not living in a studio, you can, you can like it or not. You live in a reality where, okay, we have a fear of maybe. Uh, not based on all the information, based on uh, facts always, but we live in that society, we live in that world, <coughs> who is um, as a fair for, uh, for uh, different things like uh, land trucks. And um, you saw it in the US, you see it in places, you see it in movies, books, newspapers, <coughs> that's the fact, that's the world. <coughs> and, um, and I think there are we know there are terrorists who want to use different kind of means to create that fear, and they will succeed if they if they actually get to do it. We saw it in Tokyo, seen many places. So um, okay. Mm, thank you. That was what I was trying to say. <laughs> Let me comment on that because it's a very important point you raise that the, the threat and risk assessment cannot just be done for all the biological agent at once or for the biological event. Um, you're challenged us a bit with the likelihood and the consequences of the event. And I can say you're right and you're wrong. It now depends on the biological agent. That's the main message I want to give now, is that we have to be precise with the threat and risk assessment. I can tell you there is an agent, we can name it, ricin. It's available and easy to handle. So the likelihood of an event with ricin, and we've seen this in the past, most of the cases happened, happened in the US, but also in other countries. The likelihood of an event with ricin, most of the time it's suicide, it's very likely, and the consequences, at least what we've seen until now, have been very low. When you talk about anthrax, it's something else. We had, an, an, we had anthrax cases in Chaos in Germany and uh, this year, and we went on to the, the area where, they, uh, where they've been held, held, the cows, and we tried to isolate anthrax out of the soil. And we tried to, to follow manuals which are circulating in the internet to see if they work or not. You can do the same with plague. We, we always hear the uh, statement, oh, plague, there are lots of plague outbreaks in India, just go there and, and, and get the agent. Try it. <laughs> Try to isolate your xenoplastid out of a rat. <laughs> so, and now it comes to science. Um, we need good information f to get our threat and risk assessment straight to know what kind of threats are very likely and what would be the consequences and which ones are nowadays less likely but would might have higher consequences uh, when, they, when they would happen. So you're completely right, we have to be very precise and only hard fact data will, have, will give us reliable, a reliable idea for the threat and risk assessment. And when you are handling it like we do in Germany, base a response on it, you better get it straight. And so I 
do agree with you that we need good science to, to fill knowledge gaps. comment a bit on, uh, uh, we talk about now the agents that we know and the way we know them, but then you have the emergent, the new agents, and like for instance you have the, uh, the you may call it the crossover of Basilius and Traces, Basilius Serius that have been killing great apes in Africa they, if you look at the general genome, it looks like a Basilius Serius, and they have acquired the plasmids from Bacillus and Traces, those two that are needed, with that have toxin genes and so on. And we don't know yet if this is evolving a new kind of Bacillus and Traces or not. So this is also something to keep in mind. It's the nature, the, what's going on. We happen to see it, but uh, we don't know. Is this something that just pass, or will it actually uh, stay on and be a new uh, agent that may have different uh, uh, properties compared to what is well known. Thank you. Yeah, we'll just like to to follow up to that and um, and say that I think it's definitely much more likely that the next time we'll really be meeting a challenge in this field is when we have an epidemic with a new virus from coming from natural source like with SARS and perhaps not like with the new coronavirus which we see in the Middle East. Of course that is very much more likely. We need to prepare for that and I, one of my messages this morning was that if we, if we pre prepare for that sort of situation then we will also prepare very well for a bioterrorism incidence. So, but we need both. Any more questions? Okay then um, Dr. Botnam will uh so, a few remarks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have been asked by Sissel, who had to leave for Paris, to say a few, a few concluding, give a few concluding remarks on behalf of Biotechnology Nevada and <coughs> I think we have all been gathered here today to give small contributions to the improvement of the societal security in Norway. Um, we have been looking back on the lessons learned and the processes started after the terrible event last year. I'm not confident that uh, right decisions will be made and we could obviously sit in our good chairs and blame the politicians, the decision makers. But we must also admit that even today, the professional communities, the scientists, have given mixed signals. And how can we expect the politicians to make the correct decisions when we can join together and support common joint statements? I think this is a big challenge to the society has been representing here and it has been said by many persons today that science and knowledge is important to improve our preparedness and uh, this must also in an understandable and coherent form be brought to the politicians and therefore we should try to get together and work out a joint platform, a scientific professional platform from which we could give these advice. Now I have a feeling that's more advice by scientists than scientific advice we are giving. And last but not least, I would thank all the participants here today uh, we had some problems in preparing this meeting and uh, about one week ago some of us thought that it would not be possible to carry it out but uh, Cecil, she is uh, an optimist 
and she told me that uh, this should be a success if we carried it out as planned, and I tend to agree with her now. And I would like to thank the, the speakers, and in particular those who are coming from foreign countries, from the United States and Germany, for sharing their views with us, and, and in particular Professor Johnson, I think you came in on a few days' notice. So in particular, I'm glad that you could join us today, and uh, if Sissel hadn't succeeded with that, I have a feeling that this had been not quite the same success at, as I feel it has been. So thank you very much to all of you, and Merry Christmas. Thank you.